Good evening. Our reading this evening begins in Revelation chapter 21. We'll begin in verse 1. As we're turning there, just thinking about RJ earlier, if only all of us were that attached to our Heavenly Father. Think of, uh, think of Jacob as he was wrestling that night, how he refused to let go until he received a blessing. That's an image for us. Revelation chapter 21, we'll begin in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion shall be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death." Go to verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with a great hope. For we know, Father, that just as surely as your Son died for our sins and was raised on the third day and has ascended to be at your right hand, Just as surely as all those things, Father, we know that you will send your Son again to judge the living and the dead. We know, Father, that this life is not eternal, but we are looking forward to the life to come, which is eternal. Righteous Father, we thank you for the great promises that you have given us concerning the life to come. And we pray, Father, that as we consider these promises, that we are encouraged to be faithful to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so in case you hadn't guessed, tonight I want to talk about the life to come. It's because it's good to remind ourselves every once in a while what lies in store for us, what we're pressing on to, what God has promised us. Now, this is actually something that Wayne and I were talking about in the car on the way over here. Um, the, 
The life to come is actually pretty difficult to think about and to discuss um, because a lot of it is bound up in images and a lot of it... Also, we're, we're basically considering things that we have no concept of. Right? In other words, it, God is, in communicating some of these things to us, accommodating us in hinting at things that ultimately we can't really understand on this side of eternity. Uh, is so in some way, a lot of this, despite what we are told in the scriptures, is veiled in mystery. And Paul, I think, gets that across to us in the way that he describes the resurrection body in 1 Corinthians 15. It's not going to be some totally alien thing, but it is unknown to us in the same way that a stalk of grain is unknown to the seed. Right? That's the, the metaphor that he uses for the resurrection. Right? That our natural bodies are like seeds of grain that have to die to grow into the, the full plant, into the stalk. And you know, imagine for a minute what it would be like. Imagine that we're all just seeds sitting here in the church building. And God is trying to tell us, even though none of us have seen this, God is trying to explain to us what life is like as a plant. Do you think you wrap your head around that as a little seed? What it's going to be like for you to become that plant? And again, even that is just accommodative language that Paul is using. Uh, the, the glory of the resurrection body is going to be even greater than that. Um, so the, the, the point is that the life to come can be difficult to talk about. And so tonight, instead of talking about what will be in the life to come and uh, trying to make definite things that uh, maybe the scriptures have not necessarily made definite things that because uh, you think about it, we, we like to have lots of popular imaginings about what the life to come will be like. You get all these images of uh, you know, guys floating on clouds, strumming their harps with halos over their heads and you know, puffy angel wings. Um, instead of talking about or speculating about what will be in the life to come, things that we have no concept of, tonight we're going to talk about things that will not be in the life to come. Things that unfortunately we know all too well in this life. Because that is a, it's a big part of God's promise. That there are a lot of things that we know of in this life that thankfully we will not know in the life to come. There will be no kind of distress in the life to come. And this is something that we are all too familiar with in this life. And I mean that we personally, those of us in this room, are too familiar with distress. Without going into any kind of exhaustive list, I mean, we have shed many tears for all kinds of things. But you think of the loved ones that we have lost in recent years. Think of Peggy and Bob and Louise Many of us have mourned family members falling away. We've had cancer scares. Uh, we, we have a brother who suffers from epilepsy. We have a brother who suffers from chronic pain. We have a young sister who's in the hospital right now suffering from a distress that, praise God, will be abolished in the life to come. If that kind of thing is not encouraging to us, I, I don't know how, how to be encouraged. That's good news to look at these distresses that we experience in this life and recognize that in the life to come, we won't have to deal with those things. Look at the way that this is described. Look at what is told to us in tonight's reading. No more crying. No more pain, no more mourning and death. These things are too well known to us today, but praise God, they, there will come a day when we hear of these things no more. There will be no more want in the life to come. 
no lack. I suspect that we have all run short at some point in our lives. And this can take all kinds of forms. It could be something relatively benign, like you, know, you spend a few weeks living off of rice and beans or instant ramen. I know, if you've never had that experience over the course of your life, you should try it sometime. <laughs> or maybe you've had weeks where you've had to choose between needs and something that really ought to be taken care of now rather than later ends up getting put on the back burner simply because you don't have the means to take care of it right now. And you're, you're having to pick and choose. Right? I suspect that I'm not the only person in this room who has been on food stamps over the course of my life or is who, who has had to stand in line at a food bank. Maybe you've lost a house. Maybe you've gone bankrupt or maybe you've been threatened by some of those things. These are the kinds of things that we tend to keep more private. So I can't speak specifically here about our own personal experiences. But I don't know, maybe you've run into those kinds of things. I can say personally, I've run into some of those things. And then beyond the actual trouble caused by our lack, where you're having to sit down and worry about, okay, I can, I can take care of this thing, but I can't take care of that thing. And if I spend enough time not taking care of that thing, something really bad is coming up on the horizon, like losing a car or losing a house or, you know, your teeth falling out or whatever it is. Beyond the actual trouble caused by our lack, we also, think about this, we suffer the shame and embarrassment of not being able to provide for ourselves the way that we think we ought to. If you've ever been in this situation, you know what I mean. Like not having the money to spend is honestly maybe less than half the problem, really, when it comes down to it. It is just as big a problem is the sense of shame. So what if people kind of find out that, you know, I'm having to, to pull these kinds of tricks to make ends meet? What if people find out that, you know, I'm budgeting dog food? You know, it can go all kinds of different directions. Look at what our Lord says. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. He says this a couple of times over the course of tonight's reading. Now look at the, the thing that John sees at the beginning of Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The image that we're given is of a life without lack. There will come a day when we will no longer have to worry about running out, running short. There will also be no division in the life to come. I've, I've always been enchanted by this particular image that we see towards the end of Revelation 21. We start in verse 23. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. All right, that's a great image in and of itself. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. The new Jerusalem is presented as an open city, a place where the gates are never shut. Or you look at the way that John describes that. The gates will never be shut by day. And by the way, there will never be any night there. In other words, these gates are open all the time. And the nations come in through the gates. They'll bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. So the people of all nations are welcome. 
This is a far cry from life as we know it today, where doors are shut and locked out of fear of robbery and violence. And I'm not saying don't lock your doors. Right? This is just a sad fact of this fallen world that we live in. Right? You lock your doors, please, at night. But whenever you lock your door, remember that this is not the way that God made the world to work. Right? When, you lock, when you have to lock your door at night before you go to bed, that's a sign that things are broken in this world and that we await a better life. Where not only do we not have to worry about locking doors, we have to worry about shutting doors. In this world, it's the norm to exclude people based on superficial differences. Sometimes the reason why you're shutting the gates is not necessarily because you've got any kind of worry, any kind of legitimate concern, just because you want to shut people out. It will not be this way in the life to come. In fact, the, the pattern of the church shows us that it is already not to be this way in the church. The miracle of Pentecost shows us that. That the church is supposed to be a, an image in this life of the great unity of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So that we're not excluding people over superficial differences that have, again, nothing to do with the faith. In the life to come, those kinds of differences will be celebrated without division. This is part of what is so enchanting about this image to me. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. That's something, like I, like I said, there's... We're presented with images where you could let your imagination run rampant and engage in some wild speculation. I won't do that tonight. But chapter 21, verse 26, definitely gives us a lot of room for some wild speculation. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Like, I wonder if we get to take baseball. Anyway, I said I promised I wouldn't speculate. So forget about the baseball. Like in the life to come, we're not going to have to worry about any kind of distress. We're not going to have to worry about any kind of privation. We're not going to have to worry about shutting out and excluding. There's one other thing that we will not see in the life to come. If we desire to see this beautiful life to come, we have to understand that there is this one more thing that we will not see in it, and that is sin. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And again we read, But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, this is very similar to what we were reading in Galatians 5 this morning, talking about the works of the flesh that are evident and are contrary to the Spirit. If we want to see this beautiful life to come, we need to live faithfully, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we extend the gospel invitation to all. Turn away from the ways of this world. Now, this world is full of futility. This life is full of evil, broken and marred by sin. But the way of Jesus Christ... It, it shows us, right? our Lord shows us a way to begin, even in this life, rejecting that brokenness and sin. And so we encourage you to do that tonight. Believe the good news that Jesus gave his life as a sacrifice, that we can be freed from this kind of futility. 
Turn away from sin. Confess Jesus as Lord. And be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. And walk faithfully. Endure to the end. If you're subject to the invitation, whether you need to obey for the first time or you need prayers, whatever your need may be this evening, we stand ready to help. If you'll make your need known by coming forward, as together we stand and sing. Careless soul.